So Andrew, you are Chief Executive of Humanist UK. What's your view of the impact of the pandemic on religion and belief uh, in this country? Well, I think there have been so many impacts. I mean, as a, a, as a belief organisation, obviously, we've noticed an immediate impact on, on the way that we work and the sort of work that we do, um, because, you know, you can't run a local meeting anymore. You can't have um, a local social event, at least face to face. Um, so there's a whole range of uh, effects on uh, connections between people, obviously. Um, especially connections between people of interest. I think that people are still maintaining those connections. They're maintaining them online. They're having their, their socials with you know, like-minded people, local humanist groups. But I think people are also becoming slightly more aware of what unites them geographically. You know, we've all seen these village WhatsApp groups or street WhatsApp groups um, pop up, um, this rise in volunteering, this burgeoning of sudden burgeoning of social capital, which you know, never really went away. It was always there. And so I think that... Um, uh, as well as um, belief-based activities carrying on, people have other social activities now as well in their in their neighbourhood, which I think are, um, uh, are burgeoning as well. But specifically on humanists, obviously the effect has been um, on things like our funerals. They've um, changed almost beyond recognition. Pastoral care in prisons and hospitals has changed um, out of all recognition, really under the impact of physical distancing and um, the needs to be safe. So what's happening if you give us an example on one of those, either funerals or, or chaplaincy or some kind of ministry that you do? Yeah, so funerals is, is probably the best example because to some extent the changes that have, lots of the changes that have occurred in funerals have almost been accelerations of changes that were happening anyway. You know, there was already in the non-religious funeral sector, there was already um, a drive towards deferred memorials you know, making less of a fuss about the body and the, the, those few weeks after um, death and taking more time to, yes, have some sort of committal for human remains, but then defer the celebration, the commemoration to later on and have, you know, humanist sort of thing. Our celebrants will provide a humanist funeral um, sometime afterwards. That's obviously been uh, extrapolated now, um, given that the committals have to be simple because not enough people are allowed to be at the burial or the cremation to, for it to be the whole family and friends. And also that memorials have to be deferred because they can't be held uh, in numbers now. Um, but I think there's also been other aspects of humanist funeral practice that have um, found uh, a niche in these weird times. When you think about personalization, like I was hearing from one celebrant who in place of the funeral, Although the committal was live streamed, but then in place of the funeral, they'd prepared um, the story of the life of the person, um, a personalised, bespoke sort of, you know, biographical celebration of their life and commemoration, and emailed it round the world to all the people who would otherwise have attended. Um, and that emphasis on the person and the biographical, rather than on particular ritual or revered um, funereal traditions, is obviously part of humanist funeral practice, which actually meets the present need. Um, quite well uh, humanist funerals there of course ultimately have been affected like all others in that you know the human urge to hold each other to make contact physical contacts to provide comfort and to receive solace and comfort has been you know eliminated from the equation and that's very hard so that's something that you share with with all others all faith communities religious yeah. groups as, as as well as non-religious is there something that's specific to the humanists I'm just wondering whether there's more of a connection that you've got with humanists beyond the UK, for example, because we're all grappling with this technology, or whether there are things that are coming out that have surprised you. I think that um, you're right. I mean, the, there's, there's, there's some things that we all face and uh, notice during these circumstances because we're human, and these are basic instincts which you elaborate on with your religion or belief, you know, as, as per your preferences or your culture or your tradition. Um, but we share most of these things. Um, I think particularly with humanist organisations and humanists generally, um, I've noticed a good... Le level I'd expect really of solidarity and resilience with other people you know we surveyed our members to see what they were doing in response to this and about a third of them were already volunteering formally or informally so obviously it plays to the specific strengths which again are not 
you know, unique to humanists. They're shared with many other people as well of goodwill, but the specific strengths of thinking about other people in this situation. Noticing the interdependence of human beings, regardless of religion or belief. I mean, that's a key humanist commitment in lots of ways. You know, the idea that we are all part of the same humanity, part of the same species, um, that we're interdependent. We've all been reminded of interdependence um, in the last few weeks and our dependence on, on people in, in, in some professions. I think also this situation has played to some humanist themes of um, rationality and science. You know, one of the things that I noticed in comments on, on humanist message boards were um, a certain optimism, the idea that this is a terrible situation, but it's not like the situation of previous centuries where humanity is literally in a blind panic, not knowing where this thing came from, not knowing where we could go to. You know, now we have um, scientists internationally cooperating, understanding what's happening to us. We can take um, the sort of measures that we've taken in this country and other countries because we know what's causing our misery and how to, to, to stop it. Um, so I think that those have been impressive. Now, for us in a sort of um, a culture in this country that is in large measure influenced by sort of humanistic enlightenment values to the extent that now people of all traditions sort of share those you know in some way that's one thing but if you're thinking of a humanist group in a country where three quarters of people still believe that witchcraft can cause this sort of um situation then those humanist groups um really are coming into their own uh with these values and this account um and i think that they're uh making sort of sort of headway because of it as well where might that be taking place? Because we do hear in other parts of the world where it's been very difficult to prevent religious communities from gathering. Uh, obviously, whether it's uh, in Eastern Europe with the Orthodox Easter or yes. Christmas communities. I mean, are there one or the United States of America. Or in the United States. <laughs> Yeah, I saw, so I particularly when we were hearing from uh, humanists in Uganda where this was happening, you know, and that they were, um, uh, obviously their activities uh, with the re re required human proximity had ceased but it was very obvious that there were you know religious denominations where activities were ongoing um and uh that's obviously also been the case in places like india to choose a different flavor of uh religious culture as an example um and in those Actually, the humanist organizations in India have played a really important role both historically and today now because they're often, unlike humanist organizations in sort of Western Europe that have often concentrated on, uh, you know, community services and ethics and so on, humanist organizations in India are very often focused on uh, public science education, rationality, um, anti mysticism, and so on. And so they've been working really hard um, to support. Uh, to some extent, the calls made by government departments in, in India, um, which under the current regime are not the natural friend of humanists, but um, to support those scientifically informed um, calls for the community to be safe, to, to, to distance where it's possible. Of course, it isn't always possible in a country like India for the you know, majority of households to do that. Um, so in, in, in places like that, humanist groups um, have found a new and maybe more willing audience for their message, um, at least of rationality. So we're, we're moving towards a close and I, I can't end without asking you what you think the long term impact will be. Of course, it's a complete uh, guess, so we won't hold you to it, both in terms of religious belief and practice, because you're, you're, you're very knowledgeable about that area in general. But also on top of that, or in addition to that, uh, its impact on on humanists, let's say. Yes. Okay. What, what's your view on both? Well, like you say, I mean, I'm not a betting man, so I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't like to, uh, you know, put, put, put a lot of money on it. Um, but I think in terms of um, humanists, uh, organizations and people generally, I think that um, it will set the seal on some of those trends around end of life and funerals that I was talking about show because people get used to that. It will change, I think, the way um, that we remember people, the way that we ritualize these moments, the way that we gather um, to grieve. Um, I more widely, I hope that it might put to bed the idea that the UK in particular, um, as a more secular society now, a society, you know the statistics as well as I do, where the large majority of people have no religious practice, the majority of people have no religious identity. Um, we're quite unusual in the world for that. But, 
And sometimes people have noticed that demographic trend and said, oh, you know, we'll lose the basis of our social morality. We won't be able to pull together all the things that we draw our strength from. You have know, gone because we're now the most non-religious society in the world. I think the last few weeks have really given the lie to that interpretation of, of British society. Um, you know, it's been amazing, the outpouring of volunteering, the outpouring of social solidarity, the, you know, the, the neighbourhoods. Um, support each other like we said at the beginning um, and I think that that might be a, a long-term lesson as well the idea that you, you, you can still in a very diverse society in a very non-religious very secular society um, that it actually um, doesn't have that weakening effect on the bonds of social solidarity that some people have alleged or feared legitimately that it, that it, that it might have it actually we're still we are maybe even um, because of this reason, um, a very resilient society in lots of ways, and a society where people have taken action enormously to their own detriment and deprivation in order to save the lives of others. You know, physical distancing is a self denying ordinance um, as much as anything else. Many religious people have displayed it in abundance by um, self denying their presence at festivals and, and, and occasions that are the linchpin of their own years. Um, but everyone more generally has demonstrated it too. So I think it, it, it shows us as um, a social animal with rational control um, of our instincts uh, in a very positive way. How probably, every, you know, everyone is drawing their own lessons that happen to happily confirm what they already believed, I'm sure, um, from this uh, situation. But I'm no different. And, and so that's what I draw from it. Andrew Copson, thank you very much. Thank you.